So hello and welcome to another episode of Open Studio. I'm your host, Martina Flor, and today I'm thrilled to have Annie Atkins joining me. As a graphic designer for the film industry, Annie creates graphic props and set pieces for movie productions all over the world. She worked across multiple films, including Wes Anderson's The Grand Budapest Hotel, The French Dispatch, and Steven Spielberg's Bridge of Spies. In 2020, she published a, bo she published a book called Fake Love Letters, Forged Telegrams and Prisonscape Maps, designing graphic props for filmmaking, giving readers a peek into the intricate creative process behind her designs. Annie, Annie lives in Dublin, Ireland with her family and she's here with us today and I'm super thrilled to have you. Hi Annie, how are you doing today? Thank you for coming on the show. Hi Martina, I'm good, yeah, thank you for having me on the show. It's nice to talk to you. Annie, I'm super happy to have you on the podcast today because you work in an industry that is very exciting, mysterious, unusual, and we want to know all about it. But before we dive into that, I'm curious to know about how did you, how did you all start it? How did you first get involved with graphic design at all? What were your first steps? I mean, my very first steps with graphic design was my dad was a graphic designer. So oh, okay. um, that was pretty easy for me. I just, um, when I, even when I was a little kid, that's what I wanted to do. Um, there's no no big ambition there really um uh and so i went to college um i studied visual communication design i graduate i graduated um i went to work in an ad agency as a graphic designer um you know i always thought i was pretty good at graphic design i always thought i was pretty good at art and um, everything design related you know I had a lot of confidence um, I'd done all my studies and everything uh, and then when I was working in advertising I suppose I start, started to feel like I really wasn't good at it at all mm. um, I just why, why did you feel this way I just um, I, do, you, do you know what I, I, th I think I actually wasn't a very graphic good graphic designer when I was younger when, when I was first starting out mm. um, and I think a lot of people aren't, mm. you know, it takes a long time, it takes practice, you know. Yeah. Um, but I think that kind of shook my confidence a little bit. Mm. Um, and I just decided it wasn't for me after all. I had very, I, I didn't have very good sensibilities with colour, with layout design, with typography. I didn't have a clue what a good font was or a good typeface was. Um... Um, I suppose I was just very green. I mean, I was, I was young. I was, I was a graduate. I was 20, 21, 22. Oh, okay. but yeah. I, I don't feel I had really got a great graphic design education in college. My college mm. had been going through a bit of a tricky time when I was studying there. Um, and um, I, 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 I didn't, I didn't really, I wasn't really into it mm. in college. Um, I got by. Uh, uh -huh. And then that showed, I think, when I went into the ad agency and started having to do quite, you know, traditional graphic layout design and, and things. Um, yeah, it wasn't great. Uh, so then I decided to leave it all behind me. And I decided to leave advertising, leave design and go back to go back to school and study a completely different subject. So you mentioned that your your dad was a graphic designer. Do you feel that there was a, a path drawn to you um, when you when you as you grew up uh, do you feel that your dad show you the way in 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 a way into graphic design or this was something that as as it seemed natural to you and you you had all this experience uh, growing up um, it felt like a natural path to you to go down the path of graphic design yeah it was a completely natural path like I, I think like I could say like I was a nepo baby um, <laughs> because you know if you have a parent or or any kind of like really strong role model who 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 does a certain job it's very very easy for you to follow in their footsteps you know oh, yeah. um I mean I know there's a lot of talk about this at the moment with like celebrities and actors and things um and I have to say yeah it is really easy and I see a lot of people who come to my workshops who have never had that role model at all you know they've never had anybody in their family who's a designer they've never had anybody who's an artist or who's done anything kind of visual uh for a living and they don't have that same confidence mm. you know they feel they feel much more insecure about it and it, very much like is this really something i could do and i find that with those students 
they don't need very much they just need somebody to say yeah you can yeah. you know um and uh and um that's great you know when you find a teacher who, who who does that for you um but yeah definitely i think if if you have a parent who works in in the field then then yeah it's it's a very easy path to go down yeah and i, I think also just to add to that i think sometimes you need to see someone doing that thing to understand, okay, that's something I could possibly do, right? I remember like the first time I saw, I met a, a an actual lettering artist. I thought like, oh, you can actually work doing this. And for me, there was a, a, a tipping point in terms of saying like, okay, if he's doing it, I can do it too. If he's calling himself lettering artist, I can do it as well. So you mentioned before that, um, that you left the ad world uh, because you didn't feel good enough at it so how did you then steer uh, into the film industry and creating props for films which is what you mainly do nowadays yeah so it's been a quite a funny it's it's all kind of come full circle really because because now i do work in branding sometimes again <laughs> but i have a very different approach to it now because i've gone through the whole film path so so I decided I was going to leave my, my role in the advertising agency. And at the time I'd been writing a blog. Um, now, this is way back. This is back in 2007 or something mm -hmm. when blogging was a thing before, just before social media. Um, and my boss at the ad agency, Gary, he was the creative director, a really great guy. He had been reading my blog and he said, um, you know, I'm kind, of, I'm kind of not surprised that you want to leave and maybe you do need to just go off and do something that's a little bit more emotional for a while. Mm. Um, and I said, you know, I've been thinking about going back to college and studying filmmaking. And he said, I think it's a great idea. Um, because, you know, working at the ad agency, I was doing a lot of kind of like template based work. Uh, and I think I just needed to do something that was maybe a little bit more... I don't know what the word is, really dramatic, maybe, yeah. <laughs> without wanting to sound like an asshole. Um, yeah, I wanted some drama. Um, so I decided to go to film school, but I, I didn't go to film school with the idea that I would be a, a designer for film. Mm. I went to film school with the idea that I would be, I don't know, like a director, a screenwriter, a camera operator, mm. you know, any of these jobs that, that, that are just very obvious film roles, you yeah. know, yeah. the film roles that we've heard about. Um, and then, of course, when I started studying filmmaking, because it, because the master's degree I, I was enrolled on was like very broad, we did a little bit of everything. That's when I discovered design for yeah, film. Yeah. Uh, and then it all clicked because, you know, I, it, it wasn't that I was a bad designer. I was just in the wrong role and I was just young and inexperienced and I just hadn't really found my path or a style or, you know, a way to, a way to make design work for, for things other than, I don't know. Coca-Cola magazine adverts. Yeah. So for those that are listening right now and don't know exactly what creating props for films is, can you can you shortly explain what is it about and what the work involves? Yeah, so my, my role in film is very, very specific mm. prop design role. It's graphic prop making and graphic set design. So in, in film, we, we just call it graphic design. Um, but it's making all the pieces that the actors actually handle in sets that are pieces of graphic material so newspapers telegrams bus tickets cigarette packets anything that's made out of paper anything that has lettering on it anything that has some kind of photo or illustration on it anything that has a pattern on it and this would be set pieces as well so if it was say a big piece of signage or billboards in the background or shop front signs um posters on the wall dressing for a set like notice boards in somebody's office it would have to be covered with little bits of paper with appropriate things written on them um um yeah that's it that's in a, it in a nutshell really um and it's a full-time job you know it's um i know that when we watch movies we don't see most of this stuff mm. so it's hard to fathom that this could be a full-time job for two three graphic designers for yeah. the absolute duration of a tv show or movie but it, it absolutely is like it's it's actually more work than we can handle yeah. it's very busy so let's imagine that you have recently like started a new movie project could you just to understand how your world is as a graphic designer for for films um could you guide us through the process like what are the key steps where do you start 
uh, when do you meet with the people that are involved? Um, where do you, when do you have interactions with the director? How does this project evolve? Yeah, so you're usually hired by the production designer or, or the art director um, who are the people who are designing the entire movie. Um, and you're brought into the art department with a few weeks of prep before the camera starts rolling, basically. And in the art department is where everybody else sits, like the drafts people, the set designers, um, this whole set decorating team. Uh, it's a kind of like another leg of the design. Um, and hopefully you get a desk and a chair and sometimes you get a desk lamp and um, <laughs> you have to bring all your stuff with really you. Really fancy. <laughs> yeah, you bring your computer, you bring your scanner, you bring your printer, you bring all your whatever, whatever tools you use, your pencil case. Um, <laughs> and uh, usually the first thing you do is you sit down with a script and a highlighter pen and you go through the script and you mark out anything that sounds like it's going to be a piece of graphic design. Mm -hmm because you know then that that's going to be your responsibility to produce it. Um, and then, I mean, uh, so it, with, with directors, it's it's different. It's different on different movies. Like you don't, a graphic designer doesn't always work directly for the director. Usually you're working for the art directors, the production designer, the set decorators, the prop master, whoever it is that's um, kind of in charge of any given piece. Yeah. Um, I mean, I've, I've done a lot of work with Wes Anderson in the past and he's very... Uh, he's very involved with his art department. So then you would talk directly to, to a director like that. Um, but you know, I've, I've done other movies where I've never even seen the director. So. Yeah. And Annie, I, I was wondering, because you, you mentioned that you take the script and you mark all the scenes where you believe that there will be some prop design involved. Um, so you, you don't necessarily get a, a proper briefing with a list of the different props that you have to create. You just do, you have to be kind of autonomous around um, what, is the, that the, what is the work that you need to do. You make your own list. Yeah, oh, you okay. make your own list. I mean, that's, that's how you start is you make your own list. And that list could be like 20 pages long. Mm -hmm. And this would be all the things that you identify from the script. So something's really obvious. Like if a character is sitting in a restaurant and they're ordering a meal, you need to make a menu for the restaurant. Um, you know, if, if the character's sitting in a restaurant and they're not ordering a meal, you still have to think like, yeah, but this restaurant needs menus on the tables, even in the background, you know? Sure. So you're always, you're always thinking around the whole set. Um, I mean, it, it takes practice. You get better at that as you go along, you know? The more, you know, every time you do an office scene, you think about, you, you understand more what, what, what the requirements are for a scene like that. Um, and then there are other there are other directions that that you're given. Uh, like there's often concept art. So sometimes you'll see a scene that's been drawn by a concept artist, and you'll say, "Oh, okay, there's like posters in the background of this scene, so I'm going to need to make those." Mm. And then other times you'll get verbal direction from the set decorator, the art director, the production designers. Um, and then sometimes you'll also get uh, technical drawings of street scenes, for example. And then you can see, OK, this street scene is going to have five shop fronts in it, so I'm going to need to make five shops and I'm going to have to make, you know, whatever else there is needed to dress that scene. Um, so, so the information about what you need to do can come from many, many different sources. And it usually is flying at you quite fast uh, and landing on your desk quite fast. And you have to work hard uh, to keep up with that. Yeah, in fact, I have friends in the film industry and and they're always like they're always on the run, right? And working crazy hours. Is this the same way for you as a prop designer? I think, yeah. I mean, I think time's always against you on yeah. a film job. Any film or TV show I've ever worked on, time has been against me. I don't, I don't think I've ever felt relaxed on any show, <laughs> except maybe if you're doing like the second season of a TV show that you've already done the first season yeah. for, it's a little bit more relaxed because you have stuff in your back pocket that you can pull out. But generally, like the pressure is on, yeah. Um, I mean, film hours, we, we film is unionized. So, you know, we're, we're paid from eight o'clock in the morning until 6.30 p.m. or 7 p.m., depending on the production. Um, and you can often have to stay a little bit later than that. I'm, I'm quite vigilant about clocking off when, I, and when I'm asked to like you know if, if we finish at 6 30 i try to finish at 6, 6 30 yeah. um because yeah. it's it's a long enough day as it is and it's an intense oh, yeah. day so yeah. you know it's not just long hours but the amount of work you produce in that day i mean you might produce like 20 pieces of graphic design in that day um 
so yeah i do try to leave work on time um so and it seems that a lot of things are done on the go like you can prepare things up front but some things are uh, done in the on the scene is that correct um what while they're shooting the scene yes so it seems that Ooh. a lot of the things are created in in the moment or is is that a, a is something that you plan ahead and you have all the pieces put together and then you bring them to scene I mean, I try to have everything ahead of time For sure. because the last thing, the last thing you want is to be radioed up from the set saying, you know, we don't have a telegram. <laughs> so yes. It takes, takes time to make these things. And like actors are all there. Everyone's in costume and makeup, like the lights are ready, you know, um, it, it, it does happen. It sometimes happens. Um, it happened to me on a Spielberg job. Um, we got radioed up to the arts department from from the set. Uh, we didn't have a label for a bottle, mm. a bottle of brandy. Um, and somehow I had just missed it. I'd completely missed it in the script. I'd completely missed it. Like no nobody had caught it. And it was quite a key scene because Tom Hanks's character, who was like the good guy, was being offered a, a, a glass of brandy by the baddie character, mm -hmm. right? And the feeling in the scene was supposed to be like, is this brandy poisoned? <laughs> So, uh, you know, it, 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 this is kind of what we would call a hero prop. I mean, it has it has relevance to the story. Um, it wasn't one to miss in the script, I'll say that. And I had to make it very, very quickly. I like made it and designed it, printed it out and stuck it to the bottle in 20 minutes or something. Um, and you have a little bit of time because they're still setting up the scene and, I don't know, the camera crew are doing their job and, you know, whatever they do with the lights down there, I don't know what they do. Um... <laughs> Um, but the problem is then like legal clearance and I had to send that prop to clearance to make sure that it was okay to use in the movie. And of course the clearance officer was in Los Angeles and we were shooting in Germany. Um, so it wasn't until the next morning I got the email saying, no, this is not clear to use. Mm. Um, you can't use it. It's too close. It was too, the design was too close to a uh, real Armenian brandy label. Yeah. Um, so I had a lot of sleepless nights over that because we'd already shot it, you know. Uh, oh, and what did you do then? I bet that a lot of um, our listeners are looking, are googling for this uh, uh, yeah. whiskey bottle. <laughs> um, you know, the thing is, luckily for me, most of what I make is never seen, mm. okay? Because most of the graphic design you put in the movie set is in the blurry background, yeah, it's not in focus. You know, the camera is looking at Tom Hanks's face. Mm. It's not looking at a, a, a piece of graphic design. Mm. Um, and while this can often be a little bit disappointing, um, in a case like this, it's really relieving because we never actually saw the bottle. I don't know what happened. Maybe his hand was over the label when he poured the brandy or it was out of focus or whatever it was. Um, it just wasn't seen. So that was totally fine. Um, but you can now, you, you don't know what's going to be seen. So you have to make sure that all the work you make is legally clear to use, is right for the period, is right for the, the place, is, is, is right for the genre and the tone of the script. Um, because you, you never really know for sure when you're going to get your close up. It's so interesting because you mentioned uh, now and I was uh, during my research, I also read something about the fact that a big portion of your work, 90 uh, percent, around 90 percent of your work remains in the background and should never be noticed. And you said something like um, you co quoted someone saying that um, if if our work or if the prop is noticed, then we are not doing our job right. And I, I wonder how do you approach the, creative, the creation of something like this? Because I feel that as graphic artists or most af graphic artists or graphic designers, they, you know, they invest a lot of time into creating something that really stands out, that really gets noticed. And mm. your work is rather the opposite. It's kind of like staying in the background. So how do you approach that? that yeah, sort of well, well, it's a funny balance yeah. because... That that quote is right. That was Robin Miller, my dear friend Robin Miller. He's a prop master yeah. in um, California. And uh, I think he said that in an interview that he gave to a magazine once. And he's absolutely right that when you start noticing the props, 
your eye is being drawn from the real drama that's unfolding between the characters, right? It's not always true. I mean, some directors use props and use uh, visuals as part of their storytelling. Um, but for the most part, you shouldn't be analysing the little bits of paper in the background, right? Yeah. Um, and one way we can stop this happening is actually to put more detail into our props. OK, so sometimes when a piece of graphic design has less detail in it, it really stands out. Mm. Um, but the more detail we add and the more period detail, and the more genre detail, um, the more it kind of melts into the background, blends in. Um, and that's where research comes in, really. Like we spend quite a lot of time researching and making sure we understand our different times and countries around the world and what calligraphy looked like in, you know, Eastern Europe in the, first, <laughs> yeah. in the 1930s as opposed to America in the 1950s. You know, like we, we do spend a lot of time getting these things right so that they disappear. Yeah. So and, and I was wondering about your book because um, you released fake love letters. That's a long name. Fake love letters, forged telegrams and prisonscape maps designing graphic props for filmmaking in 2020. And you, I was looking at your website, you also launch a, a domestic course, you also host your own workshops, and it seems that there's a drive in you, and correct me if I'm wrong, to share all that you know with other people, and I mean, you know, creating a book is a lot of work, and, and, and it's really no small project, and I wonder if you can share what, what your vision was um, by creating all these different elements, the, the, the book, the workshops, um, and what is the motivation behind sharing all this information with others? Yeah, I mean, I suppose my original motivation was on one of my very first jobs um, on a TV show that I worked on, um, I was being sent interns from, the pr from production. Mm -hmm. And the interns were helping me do things like cut and stick and fold lots of cigarette packets, for example, you know, yeah. um, a lot of this, a lot, a lot of these jobs are very kind of time consuming and laborious. Um, and what I kept finding was, was the interns that I was getting from the production office had no interest in graphic design mm. whatsoever. Like they were in film because they want to be the director. You know, um, that they were like the producer's nephew, for example, you know, um, and I kept thinking to myself, do you know, I know so many graphic designers who would give their right arm mm. to sit here all day and make fake cigarette boxes, yeah. you know, um, and I felt that a lot of people like coming into the graphics department uh, were not coming from graphic design backgrounds. They were mm. just kind of coming in because it was a place where we need lots of extra help. Mm. Um, and really their aim was to eventually, you know, direct. Um, and I just began to think, okay, we need we need actual graphic designers uh, coming into the industry who, um, who are really excited about all these boring graphic things that we make. Um, yeah. Because, you know, in our world, like and in your world as designers and artists, like these things are fascinating to us. Um, so that's when I decided, do you know what? I'm gonna start running workshops from my studio. Um, and I did those for a few years before I started the Domestica course. And I think my, my workshops, my private workshops here in Dublin and the Domestica course, like content wise, they're quite similar, mm. you know, um, and it's a lot of stuff from my book as well. But the domestic course is just like much more easily um, accessible, you yeah. know, because yeah. they're, they're, they're very affordable. I mean, are you familiar with domestica? Yeah, yeah, totally. Yeah, like you can learn anything you want there, you know, like yeah. for like seven euro, you know. Yeah. yeah. Um, so that was good getting that done last year. Yeah, and what is it, that experience for students that come to your studio to work alongside with you and uh, and learn from you? How does this look like? So that's the, 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 the private workshops that I run here in Dublin. That's yeah. a two-day workshop. We usually do it on a, on a weekend, uh, Saturday and Sunday, um, full days. Um, it's pretty intense. Like, there's, there's a lot to get through in two days. Um, so day one is, like... In the morning, I'm I'm talking about the industry and introducing them to the subject yeah. and um, 
showing them some little design things that I do to make things look period and showing them my tricks in how to make things look authentic. Um, and then in the afternoon, we do some little prop making exercises, uh, just like very simple things, like a little bit of binding, stitching, calligraphy, uh, not really calligraphy. Uh, it, it's more about cheating at calligraphy to create, yeah. to create period handwriting. It's more handwriting. In film, we call it calligraphy, but it's actually just handwriting yeah. um, because it's for characters uh, in, in the movie. Um, and that's day one. And then day two is over to them and they have to present an idea for a collection of graphic props that they want to make for a character. Five pieces. And they show reference material to show the kind of styles that they're looking at that they might kind of copy. And then I workshop those pieces with them so that they can go away knowing exactly how they would make those pieces. Yeah. So if somebody wants to make a newspaper, for example, like we make loads of newspapers for movies. There's always a newspaper in a movie telling the audience what's going on in the world, you know. Um, I will show them how to achieve like an old mid-century printed look and how to make something look like... I mean, I, I, th I think the problem is when, when people are starting out is everything they make looks very digital mm. and very modern and very clean and crisp and vector-based. And my whole thing is, you know genre work period work so i can show them how to stop things looking like that sometimes we use real techniques and sometimes we do use digital tricks yeah i wanted to ask you about this because it seems that you know by uh, um flipping th through the book you it seems that you do a lot of things by hand you use a real typewriter you um you dye your um your papers with uh with coffee or tea uh, so it seems that you you know there's a strong imprint of the of analog techniques in your work and i wonder nowadays and especially in in the film industry where everything moves so fast and you have so, such tight, tight deadlines as you mentioned um, how do you strike that balance between analog digital and 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 also you know sticking to the to the deadlines of of a movie project for instance Yeah, when I first started, my first job was on a show called The Tudors, which was about Henry VIII. So, yeah. you know, it's in the, what, 14th century, 15th mm -hmm. century. Um, and because I was so new to it all and everything I'd done before had been digital, you know, I, I came in thinking that I could just speed things up for everybody and do make everything digitally now, you know. And that was a real steep learning curve to me to understand mm -hmm. that, um, no, you can't just use a handwriting font mm -hmm. in place of calligraphy, you know, yeah. um, that, that we do have to do things the, the, the right way or the analog way. I mean, sometimes we use digital tricks. And, and what I've learned to do is, is cut back and forth all day long between my drawing board and my computer mm -hmm. and my scanner. So I'm constantly using analog tools like rubber stamps or real pen and ink. And then I'm scanning it in and I'm bringing it into Photoshop and I'm, I'm doing what I need to do there. Um, and what I try to tell my students is, like, don't assume that the analog way is always the slowest way. Yeah. Okay. Because it's often more effective, but it can also be quicker or as quick as doing things digitally yeah. as well. I, I mean, I've got one example, okay, and I use this example again and again, fingerprints. If you're making a fingerprint card for the CIA mm. or the FBI, how are you going to create fingerprints? Yeah. Well, you're not going to do it in Adobe software. You're going to just get a ink pad and put your fingers in it and print them onto a page and yeah. it takes two seconds, literally, you know. Um, So um, I, I, th I, th I, think, I think that's a learning curve to, to get your head around the fact if you are somebody who's worked digitally all your life to get mm. your head around the fact that um, once you get into the swing of it, you will actually be pretty quick at this stuff. That's so interesting. The, the concept of like not necessarily because it's digital, it's going to go faster. Um, so and, and also how, you know, how much analog techniques and, and digital techniques can still have a dialogue, right? And benefit from one another. Um, Annie, you have found a niche in the film industry or for film or creating graphic design for film. And I want to ask you, because this is a, a, a big question among graphic artists, graphic designers, should I niche down? Should I find my niche? Um, and I want to ask you, how do you think that finding a niche 
contributed to your success as a graphic designer and that if you believe that you know identifying a specific niche can be beneficial for those listening for new designers or a graphic artists that are coming new into the industry yeah um i mean i suppose it is niche um <laughs> Um, I mean, I've benefited for, for, from it in a couple of different ways, okay? So first of all, I mean, I was very lucky that I, I had a little spotlight shone on my work. So, you know, I, 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 was able to, I was able to do things like publish a book about it. Mm -hmm. um, um, and that's been, a, that's been a whole different journey. Um, but in terms of the craft itself, I think the way that it's benefited me mostly is that it's it's a whole new approach to design for me. So back in my advertising agency days, one of the reasons I was not a good designer is because I started every piece of design, like, you know, original design, like my own creative design, with a blank page. Yeah. Um, and we don't do that in film. You know, in filmmaking, where we really succeed is where we are open to absorbing the design from the world around us and imitating it often. Mm. Um, because if we want our pieces to feel authentic, then we need to start studying pieces from the real world, mm. whatever they are, whether it's a shopfront sign or a, an old love letter or whatever. You know, a lot of the art of film is actually forgery. Yeah. We're actually copying, you yeah. know. Um, and people who work in film, we don't have... A hang up about originality mm. the same way people out there in kind of more contemporary design surroundings do I think yeah. I think I, I find that a lot of the, the the young people or the the the, the graduates who come to my workshops mm. I find that one of the hurdles I have to get them over is to understand that it's okay to copy actually mm. now I'm not talking about you know imitating the work of your contemporaries. I'm not talking about going on to, you know, Dribbble or Instagram or wherever and like copying someone else. What I'm talking about is, for example, you know, studying an old map and letting that inform your line style yeah. or studying a piece of architecture and letting that inform your costume design or, um, you know, really, really looking at type and understanding how how it works the way it does um and i find that once people get over that and they start being more open to imitating then it's kind of downhill like then 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 we can really really get going um and for me that's been imperative not just in film work where where you have to work like that to make things feel real but also now in the branding work that i do outside of my film work um, because I don't do that thing where I open a brand new illustrated document and stare at that awful white page. Yeah. Um, you know, I always start with something real. And um, a big joy in the work for me is is in the research and finding these one weird and wonderful things that have been made over the centuries yeah. and uh, from all the different people from all different walks of life who have made this world that we live in. Um, and what I find is you never really produce something that's exactly the same because you always have to develop it, always. Like whether you're developing it to, to meet the needs of the script or the genre that you're working on or the, the client that you're working for or the product or whatever it is, like you will have to adapt and you'll start pushing yourself further. And when you get your final piece, it will be very far removed mm -hmm. from the original source material that inspired you, right? So so you just have to be unafraid to, to, to go that way. Um, so sorry, the, 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 your original question was about niche. Um, if I had to say niche at all, I would say it's this. It's this core way of working. Um, and it, it does mean that a lot of my work has a nostalgic look to it. I mean, it's supposed to. Um, that's the world that I work in. Um, but but um, I can't imagine working any other way now. And it's just, it's opened up so many doors for me. Uh, so I would say, yeah, don't be don't be afraid of being niche at all. Yeah. <clears throat> Sorry, when you say that it has opened so many doors for you, so you, 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 when you started in the film industry, just to give those that are listening an insight on how do you make your way into a certain industry, you found a niche, um, and um, how do you then continue having 
uh, jobs in that industry, right? So you had you had your first gig with a with one movie, and then it just goes from there uh, through word of mouth. Or how do you how did you work your way into getting more jobs and continuing having jobs into the industry? Yeah, I mean, my first job came up because I went to film school, and while I was studying on that degree. Um, the production designer from the set of the Tudors, Tom Conroy, he came into the school to do a module on design with us. Um, and my course leader, I remember him saying to me, oh, you know, Tom's, you know, he designs some big shows. You need to get your portfolio under his nose because, you know, you, you come from a graphic design yeah, background, yeah. so show him what you can do. So I said, okay, great. And I showed him my portfolio and he said, you should come for an interview on our third season once you graduate. And I did, uh, and um, that was my first job. And then I've been working pretty much ever since then with a few gaps, you know, there's always gaps in film when you're not working. Um, but yeah, I've pretty much gone from one job to the next. Um, so when people ask me, you know, do you think studying film is important? I mean, I have to say it was important for me mm. because that's how I got in, but I don't actually think it's the most important thing you can study. Like if, if, if you want to work in film, I don't know that studying film is imperative. I think you need to, to get into film, I think you need a trade, you need a craft mm. um, and you need to study that craft. So if it's graphic design, study graphic design, like completely know your onions about graphic design. You know, film needs people from all trades. You know, we have everybody working on a film set. We have electricians, we have painters, we have plasterers, we have scenic artists, we have set designers, makeup artists. Um, so you need you need a craft and you need to hone your craft, mm. and um, that that's that's the best way in, I think. Yeah, and it's funny because I was about to ask you, well, if I would be a newcomer aspiring graphic designer to enter the film industry, you know, what would be the process? What would be the, you know, the steps that I should follow? And you mentioned a couple of things um, just now. One of them is that, you know, it seems that for you putting your foot in the door uh, by studying uh, or actually studying film or um, um, movie making uh, help you put your foot in the door into that, that world or that industry and that made it easier for you to then apply as a graphic designer into a, um, a film production. Um, you mentioned also that you had a portfolio. Which other things or which other elements would you recommend someone um, to put together in order to land a job in, in, in graphic design for films? So I think probably your first job on a, in a film studio is going to be as an intern or a trainee in the art department. Yeah assisting the graphic designer um and to do that i think you need a portfolio that can show that you have traditional graphic design skills but also i think you need to start showing graphic prop design mm -hmm. and this is something you can do in your own time and it's it's, it's what i teach my workshop students yeah. to do you know i say go off think of a character from from fiction from a book that you loved as a kid or from a theater play or something try not to choose movie characters someone whose props have already been made um, and design a collection, a small collection of props around that character. So five pieces, you know, that say something about that character and can show off new skills and that will get you to start actually making things with your hands, mm. you know, things that you have to cut out and stick together and fold and, and dress with other things. Um, I always talk about dressing props, you know, that, that we have to, if you, if you make a cigarette packet, yeah. then put real cigarettes in it, you mm. know. Um, if you make a matchbox, put real matchboxes in it, uh, playing cards, so on and so forth. You can really start having fun with tactile objects in, in ways that we don't always when we're working in, in commercial graphic design. Um, and I always say, you know, try and choose a, a period or a genre that you're not, that takes you out of your contemporary world. OK, so mm. something from the past or the future, uh, if you're being really ambitious, uh, the future is difficult because, yeah. uh, you know, limited source material um, <laughs> um, or, you know, choose choose a fantasy genre or, you know, children's fantasy or animation or something mm. um, so that you can start developing styles or studying styles that are very different to your contemporary graphic design portfolio 
Um, but, and, and then when you do get an interview for a job, bring these things with you. You know, we don't want to just see things on screen. We want to actually hold these pieces mm. and pick them up because that's what the actors are going to have to do in a shoot. That's so useful. And I bet that our listeners are taking notes right now as I am. So I need to wrap up our uh, show. We normally play a little game, which is called a finish the sentence. Um, do you know it? Yeah, go on. <laughs> yeah, so I, I basically start the sentence and you, you complete it. So I'm proud of myself because? Um, I'm proud of myself because I've, I've, I've tried doing things that, that I wasn't very good at and uh, made them work eventually. I'm terrible at? Oh, I'm terrible at... Uh, vector work and bezier curves one day i'm going to one day i'm going to quit film completely and retrain as a sign painter we're gonna be looking after that <laughs> we're gonna keep you accountable annie um i'm always chosen first when it comes to i'm always chosen first when it comes to old tea stained maps i could never get bored of I could never get bored of my dipping pen and ink. Thank you so much, Annie. Where can people find you? Um, my website, AnnieAtkins.com. And Instagram is probably my favorite social media platform, Annie Atkins. Wonderful. We're going to add all of this to our show notes so that listeners can find you. Thank you so much for, for coming on the show today, Annie, again. Thank you, Martina. Thanks for the great chat. It was lovely talking to you. Thanks so much, everybody, for tuning in and um, see you on the next episode of Open Studio. Bye bye. So this is it. I hope you loved this episode. You can find me, the host of the show, on social networks at Martina Flor on Instagram, Twitter and Facebook. If you have a question or comments, go to martinaflor.com slash podcast where you can see previous episodes find show notes, and send voice memos with your comments and questions. You can also watch these episodes on YouTube. Just go to martinaflor.com slash YouTube to find them. You can, of course, listen to all our episodes on your favorite podcast platform. If you loved this episode, subscribe to this podcast. And if you leave us a review, it will help others find us. Thank you all for listening and see you in the next episode of Martina Flores Open Studio. Bye-bye.